Yeah, hello and welcome back to Conworks, Speedworks' own small, friendly, cozy online gaming convention. My name is Uli Blenemann and I'm having the best, the best reviewer for board games worldwide, Mr. Dan Thoreau, aka Spacebiff, as my guest. Welcome, Dan. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, well, it, it has been a long day here, but it has been an exciting day, so lots of very nice, interesting guests. We talked about games, about everything, so it's pleasant, uh, but yeah, well, it's a long, it's still long hours, but I'm enjoying this. And hello, Hans, good seeing you back, and hello, Daniel. Daniel Newman, designer, is there, and he's um, also greeting you, of course, um, Dan. Hi, um, so, as usual, if you have questions, please put them in the chat window and most probably Dan will respond uh, to them. And because otherwise he would be very, very upset, I have to again show Biff, my Biff, because there is space <laughs> Biff and otherwise he would be upset. So that is my personal or our personal Biff for the very few people who do not know you, Dan. Can you tell us a little about about a little bit about the person Dan Thoreau? What are you doing? Um, oh, huh. <laughs> I I usually don't talk too much about myself. Um, my name is Dan. I uh, I uh, I write about board games. I uh, am a professional historian, although I'm on I'm I'm in theory on sabbatical right now. Um, I have two daughters. They're quite lovely. Mm -hmm. um, I read a lot. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what sort of lurid secrets do people <laughs> want to know about? Um, I, I, uh, I very, think <laughs> it's very early here. So you're tired because you've been up all day. I'm tired because I just barely got up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I have to thank you, Dan, here. So um, Dan is not, for people who do not know this, is not on the eastern coast, so six hours before, but it, I think it's eight hours or it's ten yeah, hours even. Eight, eight hours. Yeah. Eight hours is it. It's mountain time, so it's mountain time. So thank you for, for right. being being uh, here. So yeah, and there is uh, Christoph Boer Hamilton, and he's saying hello, Uli and Dan, and... It's uh, Dan. It's that Christoph you were playing online games uh, with so oh, in, in our in in our uh, group here. And by the way, let me put in the um, website. So your website in here. So that's if for people who really haven't read anything from Dan, now is your chance uh, to do so because there is the web link. Um, what interests me a lot is Dan, you are writing reviews. Yes, you have also a podcast, you are interviewing some industry people, but you are writing reviews. And why are you writing? Because a lot of people are using <laughs> YouTube, are using some other online channels, some even Twitch, these weirdos, to, to, do, to talk about um, games. Why are you writing? Well, I think, I think that's, that's a great question. You can actually see the answer right here. <laughs> is, uh, I, I have a face for radio, is what they say. And I have a voice for, uh, for being dubbed. Or something. I don't know. <laughs> no. I and uh, I, I just love writing. Mm -hmm. You know, the the entire reason I actually started my site, Space Biff, is because um, at the time I was a student and I was doing a lot of writing. There's a lot of writing mm -hmm. in the, in history. Right? Yes. Almost all of your grade is writing. Yes. And so I was doing a ton of writing, and um, it's very stiff. It's very formal writing in history. You can't use contractions. Everything is cannot <laughs> and do not. And, <laughs> and, and I enjoy that. There's still some artistry to writing, uh, you know, formal history papers. But I, I missed being able to write playfully. Yeah. And so I started my site to sort of, to give me a reason to write something other than history. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and at first I didn't know what it was going to be about. I wrote about, you know, video games and about weird, you know, my mom had a, a little Christmas village and I put Legos in it. I wrote about that. Mm -hmm. I would write about anything that came to mind. And it, but at the same time, I was uh, starting in this new hobby, board games. And uh, so that ended up being what I wrote about most of all. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it just sort of stuck. So sort of much like the title, Space Biff was actually meant to be a placeholder. And then um, by the time I got around to thinking I should maybe update it, uh, it was it was too late and I was stuck. <laughs> so so that's that's why I, I but as to why do I keep going? That's a good question. Maybe I should quit. Mm -hmm. Maybe, no, uh, uh, please do not do so. But I think it sets you apart a little bit because if there is a ton of YouTube, there is a, of YouTube channels um, doing their stuff on games, and I'm not saying this is bad stuff. Oh, Some no. are actually excellent. Um, uh, so, um, but writing reviews, first, of course, it's it's very hard. And second, it sets you apart. And and um, so so, what is special about writing a review? So, or maybe to to even uh, add something to this already not easy uh, question is what is your writing process? You have a new game. You think I ah, I could write a review. So is it you sitting down? You have played the game. And then you're saying, well, snap, now I'm writing that piece and I never look back. Is it how you work? <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit. Um, you know, there's a, so I, I love the written word. Mm -hmm. there, there's a magic in composition. Yes. Uh, that that I, I think goes missing a little bit. And I don't mean this as a slam on anybody who's doing YouTube or Twitch mm -hmm. or anything like that. I... For, for me, if I read a review and it's been carefully curated, mm -hmm. right, um, I get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something about the presentation of it. If you're mm -hmm. going to write a thousand words as opposed to appear on a screen and, and speak a thousand words the way I'm doing right now, um, there's a certain condensing of thought that mm -hmm. happens that I, really, I love that you take all of the little filler words we use and you take all of the rambling and you, and you take all of that out and in the process it becomes something very dense and tight mm -hmm. uh, and expressive and I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I sit down to write a review, the way, the way it goes for me is first of all, there's an enormous amount of preparation that's gone into that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like my policy is I play a game either three times or until I understand it, whichever takes longer. Mm. Um, sometimes there are exceptions. Like I recently wrote about uh, Weimar, Matthias Kramer's yes. Weimar, after only one play. That's it, in part because I was, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about it before its uh, Kickstarter mm -hmm. uh, campaign ran out. So um, so I kind of felt guilty, um, <laughs> but, I, but I did disclaim it. Mm -hmm. um, but so, there, there's that prep work. I often will write kind of a, I write a lot of notes, you know, little thoughts that I had while playing. And then, um, but really for me, what what the writing process looks like is you, you if you've ever sat down with friends mm -hmm. and had a discussion about a complicated idea mm -hmm. and over the course of, of a few hours, and this complicated idea, you start having thoughts that you had never, you, you put a complicated idea into better ways of thinking because you're being forced to communicate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me, that's really where an idea is distilled into its best format. Yes. Mm -hmm. For me, the writing process is that conversation mm -hmm. um, because everything I'm, I'm writing is about how do I communicate this game Mm -hmm. And so these unformed thoughts that I've had where, you know, uh, this game does this well and this poorly and, and I felt this way while playing and it made me experience this emotion or thought, I have to take all of those and, and put them into a conversation. And it's that deliberateness. Um, and so often I'll sit down and I won't know what I'm going to say at all. 
-hmm. I won't really even know exactly how I felt about the game until I, it's in the process of writing about it. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody goes through this, right? Yes. Everybody goes through this, especially in conversation, yeah. um, where you're, you're discussing politics or society or art, and it isn't until you really open your mouth and discuss it that you discover for yourself what you thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, that's what writing is, is it's about trying to have that conversation, unfortunately, without the conversation. Um, and I love that. Uh, there's something magical to the written word, the, for me, anyway. Yeah, so, I... I so, mm -hmm. That's my process. Go ahead, Uli. Me, yeah, but, but I, um, I, I really love uh, this, what, what you were uh, just uh, s uh, saying. And I think if you're reading, or if I'm reading your reviews um, at uh, Space Biff, at the website, you feel this very much. It's, it's really something that, and you feel that there is someone who has spent a lot of time and energy to compose individual sentences. And um, so really, it, this is what makes your reviews, in my opinion, uh, special. And we have here in the, in the comments, in the chat window first, uh, uh, so it's Daniel and he's saying first uh, he has another t-shirt because you were saying earlier, why do I keep going? That should be his next uh, t-shirt, okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and Daniel is also saying, um, I love how Dan's writing often speaks more to the experience of the game <coughs> Excuse me. Than just the mechanics or components, like so many reviewers focus on. I agree 100% too. Here in Germany, we have several magazines. You know, obviously, that gaming in Germany is uh, quite popular, and the largest one, Spielbox, is has a circulation in, in print of more uh, than 10,000 in German language, and I think it's also available in English language. And um, but the reviews are more these lists of components, what's in there, um, brief, uh, some brief parts about the rules, and then you get a small, very short uh, piece, and this is what I think about the game. And then, which in my opinion, but maybe you do think differently, uh, Dan, um, there's even a numerical rating between mm -hmm. one and ten, and uh, so so uh, so so like a BGG. And I think, wow, this is why why <laughs> why am I reading this? And actually, I'm not reading this. I'm just looking at the end and uh, seeing ah, this is a five, and let's say why, and and then I'm I'm. Um, done and before you you say something here dan there's daniel who's saying when i see a new one go up so from you i often will wait to read it until i have time to really sit and pay attention to it yeah it, it's not something which you do on your on your smartphone on your cell phone and uh, consume um, yeah between breakfast and and toothbrushing or whatever so so <laughs> I really like this, but what do you think about these um, reviews uh, with these ratings and all this? You know, I, I feel like it's close. It's hard because to me, it, it's basically a consumer report, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's something that's telling you maybe do you want to buy this as opposed to really what I re would regard as like a critical review. Um, and I think they both have their place. I, I'm, I'm, I'm heartened to see that more and more people are moving away from kind of this template review. Yeah, template is a good I, word, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I just find it so uh, bloodless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's no heart to it. Um, and and I, I think we do it largely out of imitation. You know, when I, when I started writing about board games, I did plenty of template reviews. Uh, because we learn by, you know, observation. We learn by re repetition. Um, yeah. We often learn by mimicry. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand why a lot of newcomers, especially, will do will do that. And then many newcomers, I think, will get kind of bored with that and branch out. Yeah. Where where it becomes a little bit of a tragedy is when it becomes a, like an industry standard. 
Um, and in board games, it is a little bit of an industry standard right now. I agree. Um, sometimes, yeah, and sometimes with my reviews, like I'll get comments where people will be like, well, this didn't explain the rules enough. And well, you know, you could read the rule book if you're really interested. I'm sure there's gameplay videos. I, there are a thousand resources for you if you want to know the rules. I, so I'm just not interested. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't. I can't teach you the rules better than the rule book. Mm -hmm. um, now there are some people who can. You know, go go watch go watch Rodney. Yeah, watch it, play. He it's can, amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He can teach it better to you than the rule book mm -hmm. can. Um, and his his. That resource is there. I'm not going to beat him. Uh, I have nothing to offer. And we're doing so totally different things. We're not even, you know, I, I, don't, I have no interest in doing that. And he does it so well. Um, where, w w with the template review, my, my big frustration, things like um, a numerical score. For me, the problem with a numerical score is I don't know what it means. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, so like, Maybe you can help me clarify something, Uli. So here, here's, here's what I would say. So in, in the United States, for instance, uh, a score of one through 10 is pretty much always a score of seven through 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe six through 10. And that's because the American grading system, we do A, B, C, and that's down to a 70%. And mm -hmm. then as pretty much anything below that, means you're not going to place in like college mm -hmm. uh, and so at most like a six will be a bad game seven will be passing eight will be good nine will be you know you got your a mm -hmm. and ten is amazing and so you don't even use the rating system so most americans are pretty much using a, a seven through ten rating system I, is this the case in germany or yeah, yeah you, you, you see, normally in Germany, we, we don't have this 1 to 10 system. We have a 1 to 6 system. So 1 is actually the best in school, and 6 is really terribly bad. So 1 to 10 is not inside the school systems. Um, but if you see the reviews in... Um, in Spielbox or the or the numerical ratings, a lot are six to ten. Let's say seven to ten these mm -hmm. days. Of course, you could argue games on average are getting better these days, and to a degree, I would agree because you hardly see games that are unplayable or terrible from all uh, points of views. All have some yeah. uh, something good, but. Yeah, but the problem, of course, is you have a very narrow range. And, and of course, also, your aid may be totally different than my aid. And, um, yeah. and at BGG, yes, it averages out, especially with the most popular games, because there are so many ratings. But uh, in a, if you see just one reviewer uh, in Spielbox, and he's saying an eight. I can read in tiny um, scale, yeah, eight means a very good game, but I still do not know what a good game an eight is uh, for, for, for that person. So, so very, very uh, right. difficult in, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's where I break down a little bit. I don't mind a numerical score all that much, you know, put, put whatever you want in your review. Maybe <laughs> it's just an extra data point. I, I think that the reason I don't is because people tend to skip to the number. Um, I, I even I do, right? You get PC Game Gamer Magazine. I skip to the end because uh, <laughs> I'm lazy. Uh, so I don't provide that out in my own stuff. Uh, and when it's not there, I, I read the review. Um, yeah. But but it's just so con contextless uh, this number. And um, you know, one of my friends who who's English, I. This might just reflect his experiences. I don't know if this is the case more broadly. But for him, he was mentioning that because his school didn't use this A, B, C, F method the way American schools do, that he tends to use more of that rating spectrum out of 10. Interesting. And, and maybe, that's, you know, maybe that's the case. Maybe mm -hmm. people from different backgrounds with different cultural assumptions would use different numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to my mindset, Anything less than a seven is failing. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
And so, so what, do, what does the rating system mean? I have to make all sorts of assumptions about a person's background or how they value numbers yeah. uh, before I can, and it's just, it's, it's a number. Or you could write about it and tell me, you know, in detail, what you, or, or go on a video or a Twitch or a podcast and tell me what you think with words, which is how we communicate abstract ideas that are not mathematical. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you could tell me through words something about art yeah. And and then I would understand exactly where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's to me that's the real problem with the template review, uh, is that it, it tends to reduce everything into these these abstracts that don't communicate the core of the game. Mm -hmm. I, I I agree one hundred percent here. Uh, before we continue, there are some there's a lively discussion here in the chat. Let me just. I take a look here. Um, uh, 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 yeah, Rodney. Uh, Daniel is saying Rodney has no interest in doing reviews or commenting on his thoughts about games because he sees his role differently than a reviewer. Yes, there are so many different roles that you can take in this uh, industry. Um, Hans is saying uh, it is also the problem that most of, especially by those YouTubers, get the board games for free, question mark. So, um, <laughs> so there are not very neutral objective in their opinion, but subjective. And before you answer, because I think it's a, it's a, a good question, um, my take is that it's not that important. And what does getting a game for reviewing for free mean anyway so because let's say if, if i would be a, a game reviewer thankfully i'm not because i'm not that good with words like dan is but if i get a game for free sent by me from a from a publisher yes i would like to to um, to uh, do the review I think this is only fair if I get the, the game, um, but still it takes me a lot of work to write the review, even if it's less than stellar in quality. So this for free has a totally different meaning for me because I spent my time on it and I invested something in here. So I'm not sure about that free designs or free games are uh, having you have a positive review or how do you see this uh, dan i think it's a great question um and i think it's a great question because there the, when we talk about something like integrity mm. or whether a review is going to be honest mm -hmm. uh, there are any number of permutations there are concerns that we need to have with a review being honest. Uh -huh. um, and one of them, absolutely, 100%, is did the reviewer receive a review copy? Uh -huh. Now, I receive almost every game I review, I received a review copy. Uh -huh. And that is something that I am concerned about, right? If you go through my reviews and you see, well, look, every time Dan received a review copy, his games are plus two, you know, they, they, they're positive. Mm -hmm. as opposed to every time he bought his own game, he reviews them negatively. You know, that would be a pretty big indication that I am not acting in good <laughs> faith, right? Yeah. Um, now, there are, there's two points that I would make. The first one is if you, if you, so there's sort of this mental error, this error of language we go through, and it's very understandable. This idea of objective versus subjective. Mm -hmm. And th this is a problem in the English language because objective means two things. Um, objective, when we talk about objective versus subjective, that means something different than when we talk about objective versus compromised. Mm -hmm. Those are two, they're homonyms, they're, but they're two totally different words. Mm -hmm. So objective versus subjective, every review you ever read is going to be subjective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what that difference is, is objective means universal and subjective means personal. Mm -hmm. That's all that means, okay? And objective, you're never going to read a review that's objective. In fact, I would argue that that's one of the things that is bad about those template yeah. reviews. Yeah. Is that they're trying to be objective. So when I write a review, I'm, I'm trying to be as subjective as possible. 
I'm trying to tell you here are my experiences with the game. And if I'm, if I'm expressive enough about what I liked about the game, uh, you can probably infer what you will think about the game. Yes. Uh, one, of, one of the best compliments I ever receive is when somebody says, well, you really dislike the game, but I can tell I would like it, or vice versa. You know, you really like the game, I can tell I would hate it. Mm -hmm. Because that tells me that even though I've been subjective, I've been expressive enough in my subjectivity, which means that I've, I've expressed to you what I like yes. and why I like it and what worked and why. The, for me, the core is in that why that it will communicate to you something about you. And that what you're being communicated is subjective, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, because I cannot be objective. Yeah. I cannot be universal. I can't tell what Uli is going to like, right? I can't tell you what you're going to like. The best I can do is tell you why I like something. So that's, that's now over here though, we have the other meaning of the word objective, which means impartial. Mm -hmm. uh, so not biased. Yeah. Uh, now, Unbestechlich. And, and mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think this is a to this is a totally different meaning of the word objective. It means to have some sort of remove from the thing you're reviewing. So here's what I would propose. This is my second point. Good. Um, there are there are any number of ways to be objective and biased, right? And here's one of the most uh, common ways to be biased is purchase regret. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many reviews do you read where we're talking about these expensive artifacts, you know, a board game, which can cost $100, yeah. right? Um, and somebody goes and they buy a big expensive product from company name redacted, and, and it turns out that they spend $100, uh, they've spent some all-in pledge, $100, $200 for a bunch of miniatures. They play this game, it turns out nobody designed it. It doesn't have a working rule book. And they write this positive, supposedly objective here, supposedly objective review here, that's defending their purchase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we do that, because we cannot make we cannot confess to having made a mistake. We're humans. Yes. So so I would say that yes, you're right, absolutely. Getting a fruit free review copy means that I am not impartial. And as a, as a critic, every critic needs to try to be aware of the permutations to their impartiality. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, every one of my reviews, I will disclaim, I write, I did not I get this game, I did not buy it, I got it for free. But there are advantages. Um, now, in my moral calculus, getting a game for free is less actually, in most cases, less of a breach and this is just personally, I can see how this could be different for someone else. Getting a game for free, because I get so many games for free and it's so vague to me, mm -hmm. uh, getting a game for free, and also because I don't care about all that much about my relationship with publishers. If a publisher's gonna get mad at me, they're gonna get mad at me, that's not my problem really. Um, but getting a game for free to me is less of a breach to my impartiality than buying a game in mm -hmm. most cases. What I've noticed for myself, if I buy a game, I am more likely to rate it positively because I'm justifying the purchase. Mm. But there are other advantages, for instance, to receiving a game for free. One of them is, uh, it means that the critic can try things they wouldn't have paid for. Uh, two, it means that your critics aren't going to be rich. No. Mm. If, you want, if you want to have it be that the only people who can be a critic and write reviews are wealthy, um, if you want to have a culture where basically there is a price entry to having a writer, mm -hmm. then then make it so that nobody can have review copies. Um, so I, as I've said, my great life, uh, my passion, but also kind of my my parent. Ask my father. My father's a surgeon. My father would say that it's a great shame that I, I I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. I don't make much money, mm -hmm. um, and and I I couldn't write a hundred reviews a year if I was purchasing every game. I just couldn't. Yeah. Um, so if you want to price people out of, if you want an elite yeah. critical apparatus, then by all means make it so that nobody can write a review or don't trust anyone who writes a review unless they purchase the game. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, I agree. Getting a review copy, that is something to be worried about. 
but to me, it is less worrisome than any number of other factors. And the advantages of getting a review copy are actually very high. It lets a reviewer have a broad taste. It lets them try things and write about things they never would have written about otherwise. Yes. Mm. Uh, it, it lets a poor person like me, <laughs> um, a, a humble teacher, uh, it lets people who normally couldn't afford to do stuff, it lets them do it. Mm. Um, so there, there are advantages that are offsetting. And those advantages, we never really discuss them when we discuss the ethics of yes. review copies. We only talk about the ding on people's reputation. Now there are there are other compromises that to me are higher, right? Um, like being paid for a review, mm -hmm. because to me that enters the realm of marketing. Yes. Um, swag, like mm -hmm. I get uncomfortable with swag. So for example, I recently was sent a bunch of games by um, oh what's the publisher? Um, board game tables, and unbeknownst to me, they sent me this like big. Apparently, board game tables also sells like tote bags. Mm -hmm. They sent me a tote bag, and I don't know what to do with this thing. I all, I play board games at my house, right? So, uh, so to me, that's a that's a worse uh, perme permeability into the impartiality that I'm trying to project. So, there are many considerations, but that that would be my answer to that. Sorry to ramble on. No, no, no. That that was. Most interesting, and, and thank you for sharing your your thoughts. Very interesting. And Daniel is asking, uh, did you get sent a sword, Dan? And I think quite a few people know which game this was for. Uh, for. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you didn't get a sword. <laughs> did not get a sword, and I thought that was just so silly. Um, you know, and you know what, the people who got a sword, I. I take a soft line stance toward it. I do think it's silly, um, but they seem to love their swords. And Does that mean they're going to write positive reviews? I don't know. Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, I liked swords, and so I bought a sword when I went to Germany once. <laughs> and just this little sword in a castle, this, this steel sword. <laughs> and ever since, my parents had this mindset that I loved swords. <laughs> So for like every birthday and Christmas for the rest of my life, they were getting me swords. And my dad would go to Latin America and bring back a machete. And so I've got like 30 swords and I don't use them. I don't display them. I'm not a sword guy. Yeah, but, but 30 uh, or 31, so that, that could be the, it could know, have been I, the difference. So, so part of me is like, well, it's my birthday. Where's my sword? <laughs> You know, um, yeah. So, so to me, maybe it wasn't as exciting as to somebody who doesn't have thirty swords. <laughs> and Daniel is saying, "Damn, I'm jealous, jealous of your sword, co sword collection." And maybe yeah. I should buy a sword in Germany next week. Yeah, <laughs> maybe this is something <laughs> you, you need to purchase. What did you bring back from Germany? Here's my wooden small sword. Here, look at this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but uh, Dan, this was very insightful, and I think um, it made me thinking, uh, just like your your reviews, so, so really uh, wonderful. Um, but let's change subjects here for okay. for a little while. So um, I would like to hear from you. What are your top three games of this year? And it, we already talked before. If they are not from this calendar year, this is fine. But I would like to hear something from you. Well, okay. So I, I, I'm bad at top games, but here's the three that jump to mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one, um, I, I am really smitten with Fred Serval's Red Flag over Paris. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason for that is, is Fred is doing some really exciting design work. I don't know if you know Fred. Yeah, I had him um, in my, my Spielworks chat recently. So I know him, but just uh, from, from an online. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to sit down with him and uh, we did a live stream where we talked, or I don't think it was live, I don't remember, where we, we played PAX Renaissance. Mm -hmm. We did a teach and a, dis and a playthrough and a discussion. And that was just a delight. I think Fred is doing uh, some really exciting stuff. Yes. And, um, and and in a way, to me, he kind of represents the next the the rising generation of war game designers, 
where he's thinking a little bit more about, okay, so what is this conflict? You know, in any war game, there's this, this boundary problem where, okay, so what is a war? Yeah. And what are objectives in war? What are victory points? And I really like that Fred seems to be thinking about some of those issues. You know, the old guard who, who used to design war games and still are, many of them did such wonderful things. And I'm not saying this as a slight yeah. on them at all. But I think that what they did was they did wonderful things that created this war game genre. And now kind of the rising generation is, is questioning some of its assumptions and broadening it a little. And I think Fred is on the forefront of doing that. So I, I really like Red Flag Over Pairs. It does some really clever things. And it's so easy. Yeah, it's so digestible. They're very it's, smart. It takes an hour. Yeah, very smart game by very smart uh, person uh, really um, yeah good work by it, it is by gmt games the first edition is sold out but you can already pre-order the second edition will come out so yeah it, it's a popular and my question of course is, is it an eight or a seven or a nine then you don't have to I don't answer know. <laughs> I, probably, a, probably an eight or nine i don't know um, <laughs> no oh, okay <laughs> A or, a or a B, I don't know. Um, the other, so that, that would be my first game. My second one um, is uh, Heading Forward by John Dubois. Um, and mm -hmm. what this is, this was published by Amabel over at Hollandspiel. Mm -hmm. And it's a game, uh, it's a solitary game about living with brain damage mm -hmm. uh, and trying to go through the process of recovery. And it does so many things. Um, it's it's a game that's criticizing the American healthcare system. Mm -hmm. It's a game that's talking about the difficulty of you've received brain damage and you can't remember uh, even mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do to recover. It, it does so many things and it does them so well. So I love that little game. Um, I I hope it catches on more than it has. Um, mm -hmm. And my third one. Um, just to, to interrupt you uh, briefly, I haven't played that game um, because I'm not that much into solitaire games, uh, solo games, um, but yeah. it sounds interesting and you did write a wonderful review of uh, that game too. So if people are, are interested in, check out the review at spacebiff.com and this may be something for you. And of course, Holland Spieler, Emma Bell, this is a wonderful company to support anyway. So, yeah. So, sorry to interrupt. Holland Spiel is doing great stuff, um, in part because it's allowing itself to do weird stuff and offbeat stuff and little things. Uh, you know, as you know, so many times with a publisher, you have this obligation to make sure every game is is going to hit a certain critical mass. Yeah. Uh, Holland Spiel, that is not their model. Yeah. They mm -hmm. will sell a little game, which uh, is great. Um, yes. My, uh, my third one, Turncoats uh, by Matilda Simonson. Have you played Turncoats yet? No. Um, I, and actually, I have to yet place my order. But again, uh, just to, to let everybody know, there's not even a review of that, this game at Space Biff, but you can have this wonderful uh, podcast episode with Dan and Matilda, which is really, which got me more interesting into, interested into the game than even your written review. What I found interesting that it has its roots in a way in Pax Pamir and in other stuff. Yeah. So it's really fascinating. So so back to you. Sorry for this interruption again. No, not at all. Uh, it's just a, it's a fascinating little game. You know, she designed it because she goes to like Renaissance fairs and things like that, medieval fairs, and she wanted to design a game that was simple, like people could play it. <laughs> hmm. You know, in former times, games didn't tend to have. Yeah super complicated rules the way we've become accustomed to but also it looks she makes them by hand yeah. so it looks like uh it looks like something you might play in yeah. a, at a medieval setting and um it's very simple but it's very evocative it's a very smart little game um if you want to order it my understanding is you might have a few months uh delay because unfortunately she does make them by hand and i feel i don't know if i should feel good about this or or a little guilty Apparently, my review swamped her order system, <laughs> so she she doesn't even. So if you've placed an order and not heard back, it's probably because, uh, well, she's getting to it. Um, 
but it's a lovely little game. Uh, it does a lot of things with, with control and with uh, upping the stakes that, that even really polished, uh, you know, heavily produced games that are trying to do that sort of thing. Th this cuts to the heart of, of what brinksmanship is in a way that even very well produced games often miss. Uh, so, so I love turncoats. Yeah, well, well, that's one. Well, from your podcast, from your review, what I think is, is very interesting how um, strict Matilda was in her design process, having going from more components to less components, because less components, yeah. at least in theory, mean less rules and all this. So, and, and, and trying to, yeah. to work with a minimal level of different items in the game and still have a great gaming experience. And I think this is true mastery because if I would be a designer, I could probably design a game with one more chrome and chrome and chrome and having it more complex and more complex because I'm not good enough to distill it to, to the um, uh, to, to, to have the real focus. So, yeah, very, very interesting choices here. So, so but it needs three players or is it, no, it's two, two to six, right? Or two to four? Yeah, you, you can play two. I think it goes up to, so up to five, I think, or six. I think it's five. Um, but I haven't played it at two. Apparently it's very cutthroat. I played it at three and that was quite cutthroat. Um, one of the moves you can make is passing, effectively. It's not quite passing, you're, you're negotiating is what she calls it. And you reach into a bag and get a new gem, but then you have to throw away one of your previous ones. And um, it's the only action in the game that you are not divesting a gem, mm -hmm. because you're also gaining a gem. So the sum is zero instead of negative one. And um, it, when somebody does that, you know that they've just extended their longevity in the game, so everyone else wants to pass. But that's the end game condition, is everyone passing. So it forces you to, even though maybe this player's passed and this player's passed, just to keep the game going, you're like, well, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to invest more on the board. Uh, it's, it's just a, it's a cracking tension. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very good. Yeah, I need to place my order. So she's even more swamped with uh, orders. So <laughs> that's what will <laughs> happen. And there is a comment from fellow publisher from Berlin, Quality Beast Games. He's saying, um, love your writing, Dan. Uh, some of the best board game editorial on the internet. No, not some of the, the best. So scratch some of them. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I agree. That's what I also uh, think. And Daniel has to leave here. Shoot, I have to leave. I have a great, have a great day, everyone. Yeah, good seeing you, uh, Daniel, next week in, in Essen here. But we are... Uh, yeah, we are close to finishing this um, and thank you very much um, to all the viewers here for um, yeah, spending time on a Saturday, but even more, many more, much more thanks to Dan, to you. Uh, it's early over there and taking your time on a early <laughs> Saturday morning, giving us your insights and it will keep me thinking about writing a review. No, fear not, I'm not writing a stupid review, I'm not that good <laughs> and creative, but uh, yeah, what a review can do and of maybe we, if you like, uh, we could have this also in the Spielworks chat, writing a review and I would like to talk about what's the difference in a game review to a book review or movie review or maybe are you doing reviews or critiques and all this uh, thing? So there's so much here we can we can uh, talk about. And, but yeah, let's see what we and of course let's play an online game soon with Christoph and and uh, with others. Maybe a Pax Renaissance if you teach yeah, the rules. Good. If you teach <laughs> the rules uh, <laughs> um, and I hope that you write rules for a long 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 time then yeah thank and you. um i thank you for all your your work and everybody check out spacebiff.com and it's mandatory no 
question. Um, I will close the stream now. I will be back in 15 minutes. You have to reconnect and this is just the outro. There's a brief quiz with some stupid questions on games. You can actually win a game or two and then Conworks is in the can. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, Uli. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.